Thank you. It's such an honor and privilege to be here. Those of you who were lucky enough to go to bed around 10 o'clock last night, your deepest sleep happened around 2 o'clock. And even before you woke up, your body temperature began to rise, your body warmed up for the day. And then, as soon as you opened your eyes and got some bright daylight, your melatonin level, the hormone that keeps you, keeps you asleep, actually drops. And then cortisol level, the stress hormone begins to rise. Uh, that's when the bowel movement is also more likely. And this is the time of the day when our body's insulin sensitivity is pretty good. So that means this is the time to grab that sugary treat uh, and sugary breakfast. And this is also a time of the day when our brain is most active. And no wonder they put my talk at this time of the day. <laughs> and as the day progresses, um, everything kind of coincides. And towards late afternoon, early evening is the time when our muscle performance is the best. We have less risk for injury. And we are also more likely to win that uh, gold medal in Olympics. And in the evening, as the evening rolls in and dark, uh, we get exposed to darkness, then the melatonin level, the sleep hormone melatonin level will begin to rise. Um, then our body will cool down and we'll go back to sleep. What is interesting is, if you lock me inside a cave with no sense of outside day and night cycle, then my body is programmed to go through this daily rhythm in a very predictable and accurate fashion. The only difference is I will run at a 24 hours, 15 minute cycle. So that means we are pre-programmed to go through these rhythms. And not only these rhythms, many other rhythms. And in this context, you'd wonder, um, so what is the deal? Um, what is the big thing about these rhythms and why we should care? The interesting thing is, although these are pre-programmed, the way we eat, uh, the time we spend awake, all of these factors can affect our rhythms. So in this context, almost 150 years ago, when there was no modern technology, there was no electricity in the pre-industrial era, um, our rhythms are very different. And our ancestral rhythms are very different because we had access to complete darkness throughout the night. Maybe in the evening, we had a little bit of firelight or candlelight. So as a result, we used to, our ancestors used to sleep for at least seven, eight hours, very deep, restful sleep. And in the daytime, there was a lot of bright daylight, so that helped them to reduce their melatonin, increase their stress hormone cortisol or alertness, and then they were also physically active throughout the day. And food was scarce, so people, if they're lucky, they had two or maximum three meals, and in the absence of food preservation or refrigeration, most of the food was consumed largely during daytime, except a little bit food at the fireside in the evening. But in the modern days, our rhythms are very different because we spend almost 24 hours in dimly lit room. Uh, because we know from cell phone uses that humans spend 87 plus percent of our time indoor. And that includes both day and night time. And when we spend time indoor, we don't have access to that bright daylight during the daytime. And also at night time, we're exposed to light, which we're not supposed to. So as a result, our sleep is reduced, sleep is disrupted, and our physical activity has gone down. And we have been told that our brain cannot function unless we eat. So we keep on eating in every two to three hours. <laughs> uh, just imagine, since morning, you must have had two or three bouts of um, food. And as a result, what has happened is, as long as our eyes are open, our mouth is open. And, <laughs> and this, disrupts our circadian rhythm in many different ways, and I'll get into that detail. But the point is, um, when you lose one night of sleep, a couple of nights of sleep, when you are caring for somebody, or if you are meeting a deadline, then you, you'll just lose a little bit of sleep. You'll feel cranky a little bit. There is mood swing. Uh, you may be a little sleepy. Uh, so these are not disease. These are just uh, discomfort. But at the same time, if there is a pre-existing condition, for example, some people who have autoimmune disease or something else, even this small disruption for one or two days can, dis can play at that up. And 
uh, what is interesting is if these disruptions continue for weeks, months, or years, as in case of, say, firefighters and uh, cops or nurses um, who do ship work, um, last 25 years of medical literature has shown us that there are nearly 100 different diseases whose risk goes up because of ship work. You might think, well, this doesn't relate to me because I am not a ship worker. But the definition of ship work is this. If somebody stays awake for three hours between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. for at least 50 days in a year, so that means once a week. So if you're staying awake in the weekend, partying for a <laughs> few hours, you are actually following the lifestyle of a ship work because a body takes one day to readjust to one hour of disturbance. So if you stay awake for three extra hours, then for the next three to four days, your body is just trying to catch up. So what you're seeing here is not only babies, um, teenagers, uh, but also middle-aged adults and older adults, uh, they are prone to the circadian disruption induced increase in risk. And the field as a whole, the circadian rhythm field, uh, we are interested in three different aspects. One is how to improve our rhythms uh, that I call training our circadian clock. Second is, um, as we learn more and more about circadian rhythm, what we are finding is almost nearly every drug that we take for any disease, uh, they're more likely to be most effective at a certain time of the day and less effective at another time of the day. So that means in the near future, in the next five to 10 years, we'll learn more about what time of the day we should be taking out drugs. For example, only last week, there was a last study that came out showing that the blood pressure medications taken in the, at bedtime is much more effective than blood pressure medication taken in the morning. So this is just the tip of the iceberg because we'll begin to see this kind of studies coming out. And then finally, when clocks break down, can we develop small molecules, drugs that will reactivate our clock? And in that case, uh, just recently in the last couple of years, we are seeing that in many cancer, in many tumors, there is no circadian clock. And if we reactivate circadian clock by these small molecules, then we can kill cancer much more effectively than the existing drugs. So in that way, this field of circadian rhythm has much more to offer than what we know now. Uh, but the good thing is there are actionable items that we can do, do right now from today onwards. So then the question is, how does these clocks work and why we have them? Almost all of you know about sleep-wake cycle, and the bottom line is uh, we can simplify it to this very simple idea that our brain has a clock, and when we say there is a clock, that means there is a peak time when our brain functions much better, for example, middle of the day or now. At the same time, the brain also needs some downtime during our sleep so that the brain can repair, reset, and rejuvenate every night. So similarly, what we found in last 20, 25 years is almost every organ in our body, even every cell, even our hair follicle, even our skin cell, every, every single cell has its own clock. So that means just like the brain has a peak time of performance and downtime to rest, every organ may be most effective in doing their job at a certain time, and they also need some downtime uh, to repair, reset, and rejuvenate every night. And the brain acts as a master conductor to coordinate and orchestrate all these rhythms so that on a daily basis we have daily rhythms in sleep, mood, metabolism, and even our gut microbiome also got rhythms. Then the question is, how are these rhythms connected to the outside world so that when we travel from west coast to east coast and vice versa, we can reset? Uh, for a long time, people knew that the light coming through our eyes resets our master conductor or master circadian clock in the brain. But this pathway or this mechanism is not as simple as just uh, seeing a nice scene because there are many people who are blind, visually blind. There are many rats and mice who are blind. They cannot see anything. They can also perfectly reset their clock. So this was known for almost 90 years. And finally, almost 18, 16, 17 years ago, uh, three different labs, including mine, we co-discovered a new light receptor called melanopsin. You don't have to uh, remember that. The bottom line is uh, this is a blue light sensing protein. It was initially discovered in frog skin. And this is the power of basic science done in frog skin, how frog skin changes its color that led to this discovery. 
And what we find is in human retina, there are nearly 5,000 to 7,000 these blue light sensing neurons or nerve cells. And these are literally hardwired to the master clock in our brain. They also send their um, connection to 15 other brain parts. And this is actually the picture of those neurons in a retina. So you can see these squiggly neurons kind of spread out and almost act as a light net, light capturing net, so they can capture this blue light. And why this is important is, uh, over the last few years we have figured out that these cells are less sensitive to orange light. So that means they're less sensitive to candlelight um, or firelight. So when our ancestors were using firelight or candlelight, although they could see, the brain was thinking that it's already dark, so melatonin was rising and they could go to sleep pretty well. At the same time, these cells are also less sensitive to overall light. For example, although I'm standing here and I can see you all, uh, my melanopsin cells are not fully fired up. For my melanopsin cells to fire up, I have to go outside, not really looking at the sun, even if I'm outside near the window, then that much bright light is enough to activate my blue light sensors. It will synchronize my brain clock, raise alertness, and it will keep me more happy, reduce depression. So why this has become important is over the last 150 years, as I said, we spend most of our time indoor, and in the evening we have exposure to brightly lit rectangular objects, TV, <laughs> cell phones, smartphones, and computers. And that bright light is enough to activate melanopsin, a blue light receptor. It disrupts our circadian rhythm. It reduces sleep hormone melatonin, and we have poor sleep. And then during daytime, just like you and I are doing, we are spending most of our time in indoor, and this is not enough light to reactivate our melanopsin. We have reduced alertness, and we have foggy brain. So we go back and forth between sleepless night and foggy brain, and if it continues for years, uh, for many days or weeks, then that can increase the risk for many of these diseases. And in fact, we know that in winter time, in northern latitude, people get depressed. And this is a clear example. And at the same time, many of you who had kids, you know this term, postpartum depression, people think that part of it is just having a new baby. But I would, suggest, I would argue that a part of it is due to the new moms getting stuck indoor all 24 hours for many, many days. So this science of light, how it affects circadian rhythm, mood, depression, et cetera, is just growing. And so is the industry, the lighting industry is now gearing up to figure out how to improve lighting to promote health. And you are just seeing the tip of that iceberg because when your cell phone switches from bright light to orange hue around nine o'clock or 10 o'clock at night, uh, due to that night shift feature, uh, this is just a nudge to make you aware that there is this effect of light. But in future, what we foresee is there will be lighting revolution in NICU. For example, premature babies who are subject to light-dark cycle are more likely to get better and be released from hospital up to even a week earlier than kids or uh, newborn babies or NICU patients who are under constant light, which is the standard of practice now. So in future, as we for the first time in human history, we have complete control over the quality, quantity, and timing of light. And simple technology like that can be used in NICU, in ICUs to reduce delirium, even in international space stations to keep our astronauts awake and alert and more happier. And in fact, a couple of years ago, a new circadian lighting system was installed in international space station. So in future, what we foresee is this lighting will be universal and circadian lighting will not only um, light up our inbuilt environment in a, in a much healthier fashion, there should be also sensors that will sense our circadian rhythm and will tune lighting. But I'll change gear now because almost 10 years ago, we made another discovery. That is, if mice, initially we saw it in mice, if mice are given food at the wrong time, then food can override the effect of light. So now, all these peripheral clocks in our organs track food, not light. So that means in the middle of the night, for us, if we eat food, then our body thinks that this is middle of the day, and that can disrupt 
a lot of rhythms. And uh, I'll give you some very simple example how eating time may affect our rhythms. For example, in the morning when you, start your, when you started your breakfast, then your body started to use some of the carbohydrate or glucose from this food to fuel our body. Uh, this is, so that's what I call a body started burning carbs. At the same time, it stored a little bit of fat. And during lunch and dinner, it will continue to do that. Then after the last bite, maybe after two or three hours, our body will slowly run out of easily accessible sugar. So then slowly, it will tap onto the stored fat. So after five to six hours of our last meal, our fat burning will slowly just marginally rise, and maybe after eight to 10 hours, our body, may, uh, our body will significantly use more fat. And that's the time also when our stomach lining will get repaired because every day we damage seven to 10 percent of our stomach lining cells. And they have to be repaired every single night. And that happens only when there is no food in the lining. Just like you cannot repair a road when the traffic is still flowing, we cannot repair our stomach lining when there is food in the system. As simple as that. So when we, cannot, when we can repair our stomach lining, that also prevents disease-causing bacteria or allergic-causing chemicals from our food from entering our body. And there are a lot of other rhythms that happen, and most of those rhythms relate to repair and uh, reprogramming of our cells. Then in the next morning, so it takes almost eight to nine hours to switch from burning sugar to burning fat. And within 15 minutes of eating that first breakfast, that switch flips over. And a body, again, begins to uh, burn only sugar and store fat. Now imagine if we take the same meal and spread it over 15 hours, then we don't have enough time to make that nighttime switch. So as a result, a lot of our rhythms disappear, particularly the repair, resetting, rejuvenation rhythms are disapp disappear uh, when we eat for longer time. So this was, you may think that this is just a model, and uh, we also thought initially, so we went back to um, a mouse room and did some very simple experiment. We took two identical sets of mice, were born to the same mom in the same room, had the same microbiome, had the same gene. They were eating the same food and exactly the same number of calories every single day. The only difference was the mice on the top got to eat whenever they wanted to eat. And the mice in the bottom, they were trained to eat the same number of calories from the same food only within eight hours in the beginning. And then we have redone the experiment um, at 9, 10, 11, 12 hours. And what was interesting was after 18 weeks, the first group of mice were completely obese, had diabetes and many other diseases, whereas the second group of mice that had the same number of calories from the same food were completely protected from all this disease. Not only that, we went back and redid this experiment. We took the first group of mice and then told them, OK, so now you cannot eat whatever you want. You can eat the same number of calories from the same food, but you have to eat within 8 to 10 hours. And we could reverse many of the disease. Not only that, they can eat 8 to 9 hours for five days in a week, and two days they can party whenever they want, and they can still. They did still reverse many of the disease. So then the question was, well, we, we cured hundreds and hundreds of mice in our lab. <laughs> you know, that doesn't move the needle for humans. So that's why we started a new program called MyCicadianClog.org. This is a website where people can go, sign up, and then download an app, and then take a picture of what they eat. And from there, we get what, when, how much people are eating. And we had the first set, we had 156 people who were not shift workers. Uh, they were just regular office worker. And uh, what we found was um, very interesting. Although people say that they eat three meals a day within 12 hours, uh, here is eating duration of 156 people. So this is the time when the person had the first meal, or first calorie, 6 a.m. And this person had the last calorie at around 6 p.m. So as you go up the ladder, you can see this person is starting around 5 o'clock in the morning and is ending around 3 o'clock in the morning because maybe he's waking up in the middle of the night or doing something. So the bottom line is we found nearly 50% of adults 
eat for 15 hours or longer. So that means if the first calorie was at 6 a.m. in the morning, uh, coffee with cream and sugar, then the last calorie, whether it, it was a bottle of beer or wine, happened at 9 o'clock at night or later. So now what we're doing is um, we're doing quite a few clinical studies, both in our lab and also in our cl uh, clinical collaborators' labs. If you look up clinicaltrial.gov, there are nearly 50 studies all over the world trying to do very similar to what I'll show you now. Um, what we try to do is for adults, we ask people to be in bed for eight hours because if you are in bed for eight hours, you're more likely to sleep for six and a half to seven and a half hours, which is good for adults. And for kids, it should be 10 hours. And for babies, it should be 12 hours. And forget about the actual uh, time there because ignore this time. Uh, after waking up, give yourself one to two hours break because that's when our sleep hormones are going down, our alertness hormones are going up. So what I call it, this is the changing of the guard. And <laughs> you should not eat during that time. So avoid food for at least um, one hour after waking up. And then after you start your first calorie, try to count for eight hours, 10 hours, 11, but no longer than 12 hours. So all your calories should go in within 12 hours. And also make sure that the last calorie goes two to three hours before you go to bed. Because of another reason, because that's also another time when the wake hormones are going down and sleep hormones are going up. So that's again another time of changing of the guards. And you should not be eating at that time. And that's also the time when you should avoid some bright light. And during the daytime, don't forget to go outside and get at least 30 minutes of daylight because daylight is the biggest synchronizer of the brain clock. It's also the best antidepressant. And it's plentiful, it's free. You just have to step outside. <laughs> then, and all the studies that are going on are trying to figure out whether circadian rhythm sustains all of these healthy functions in our body when we have erratic lifestyle, when we sleep less, sleep randomly, or eat randomly, whether that leads to some of this disease. And by time-restricted eating, by managing light, and by just stepping outside for a few hours during the daytime to get enough light to resynchronize our clock, can we reverse, prevent, and manage some of the chronic diseases? And this is I think uh, even if adults can start to do this, that leaves a good example for the kids so that kids can grow up with optimum circadian rhythm and we can have our next generation with optimal circadian function. So for those of you who want to learn more, I just published a book, Circadian Code, and there is much more in this book. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>